supports missions in a big way. They gave us the money to build three churches. And they do not have a church building that they own to worship in. They are a new church, eight years, seven years. They are looking for land to build their own church. But before they got their own building, So I welcome my friend, a man of God from Conway, Arkansas, in the USA, Pastor Paul DeHaan. Good morning. Do you love Jesus? It is so good to be here this morning. It is so good to be in God's presence. I feel Jesus in this place today. He's here. <laughs> Hallelujah. And it is, it is such an honor to be able to speak to you this morning. And it is an honor to stand behind this pulpit. And I am so encouraged to see what God is doing across this, this nation and across this world. You know, every time God calls a young person to preach the gospel, it ought to encourage you because that means he has not given up on the human race. If he's still calling people to preach the gospel, that means he's still willing to save people. Hallelujah. So I want to give honor today to our president. Give honor to the president and to his lovely wife. Thank you so much for allowing me the opportunity today. And I want to give honor to Brother Maddox for, for just carrying me around these last few days. I have enjoyed every minute of it. And uh, also want to just take a moment and give honor to Adam, uh, who has just drove us around and just had a servant's heart, a servant leader. And I love him. And he is he's my brother. My brother from another mother. <laughs> I love him and I appreciate him. If you have your Bibles, I want you to turn with me this morning to the book of Philippians. And I need you to listen fast because I'm going to try to talk. I've got a lot of things I want to say. I don't want to talk too fast, but I don't want to go over my time this morning. The book of Philippians chapter number two. And the Apostle Paul, as you know, wrote the book of Philippians to the church of Philippi. And he's my kind of preacher. The Apostle Paul is my kind of preacher. Because I was reading the book of Philippians one day, and I get 60 verses into the book. When I come to chapter 3, so he's reading 60 verses, chapter 3 and verse 1, he says, Finally, my brother. And then I look at the book, and I look that he writes 44 more verses. That's my kind of preacher. So today when I say in closing, that means absolutely nothing. <laughs> so let's read in Philippians chapter number 2 and verse number 5. The Bible reads like this. It says, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant was made in the likeness of men and being found in fashion as a man he humbled himself and became obedient unto death even the death of the cross wherefore God also has highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess 
that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Would you just bow your hands with me and let's pray. Lord, we just thank you for your word. Thank you for the power of your word. And God, we ask for the touch of heaven to be upon this message today. God, that you would give us ears to hear and to apply it to our lives that we may serve you better. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. So the Bible says in this fifth verse, verse 5, let this mind be in you. And I believe it is important that you and I have the mind of Christ when we are serving God. You know, you can see somebody who can be physically grown, but not mentally grown. Maturity is a state of mind, not age. It's not size. You can see ministries that grow big and they have lots of people that come and, and listen to them preach, but they haven't matured spiritually. They're shallow and they're, they're immature in a lot of ways. And the body of Christ has to act like the mind thinks, like the mind of Christ. He is the head, we are the body. And when the body starts to act like the mind thinks, then we grow up to become the fullness of the stature of Jesus Christ. When I think like Him, I can act like Him. And I can do what He did. And I will say what He says. And I walk like He walks. So we have to have this mind of Christ in us. But before we know, before we can know what this mind is, we have to study this text and consider what He's trying to tell us. What mind? is he talking about? So let's look at this text in a little more detail this morning. If you have your Bibles and would continue reading with me, look in verse 6. The Bible says in verse 6 that Jesus was in the form of God. In the form of God. He eternally existed as God. Jesus has always been God. He always will be God. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And he's always been God. John says in the beginning What's the word? Jesus. He's always been God. He was with God and was God at the same time. Speaking of the Trinity, with God and was God. And in the form of God, this text tells us. He eternally existed in the form of God. The word form comes from a Greek word, morphe, which means an outward form. He looked like God. He was God. He had the glory of God. He had the splendor of God. He had the power of God. He had the divine presence of God. And God serves no one. Everyone serves God. God is beneath no one. He is above everyone. He serves no one. That's the idea of God. God is above all and serves no one. And yet, the Bible says, Jesus in the form of God, took upon himself another form, the form of a servant. Do you see it in the text? Who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation and took another form, the form of a servant. Now I want us to look at this text in verse number seven now. Because in verse 7, there's this word, Jesus made himself of no reputation. No reputation. I find it very uh, ironic and very sad that there are so many preachers that want to make a name for themselves. And they want to make a reputation for themselves. So that their name is great. When Jesus came to this earth, he made himself of no reputation. And he is our example. He is our pattern that we are to pattern our lives after. Not to make a name for ourselves, but to lift up our heavenly father. He made himself of no reputation. And the word no reputation is a Greek word, kinos. Kinos, and I want to talk to you about that word for a minute because it is so important. And everything else I'm going to say revolves around this word. So I want you to hear this word, kinos. Kinos means to empty, to drain, to vacate, 
to relinquish, to empty oneself. Jesus emptied himself to come to this world. He emptied himself to come and be the Son of God on this planet. And we understand that when he came to this world, when he was born of a virgin, he never stopped being God. He was always God. But, however, he emptied himself of certain things in order to come to this planet and serve humanity. He never stopped being God, but like you take and pour water into a container, Jesus poured the entirety of his deity into the picture and the container of his humanity, resulting in him being fully God and fully man at the same time. He was not half God and half man. He was all God and all man at the same time. And so he added to himself the existence as a man. He added to his divine essence the essence of a servant. So that when we see him show up, the very first things that we, the very first words recorded that he spoke is, I must be about my father's business. He lived to serve, to serve his father. I must be about my father's business. The first words, the last words he ever spoke on the cross, it is finished. From the first to the last words, he was about serving his father, being a servant. And the way you serve God is by serving others. You aren't really serving God if you aren't serving your brother and sister. You serve others. And show the love of Jesus by serving. And so to come to this earth, Jesus emptied himself. And what, what did he empty himself of? Five things I'll give you real quickly. And I don't have a lot of time to go into them. But the first thing he emptied himself of, he emptied himself of his God form to take human form. The word made flesh. Tabernacle the us. Loved among us. Romans 8 and 3 says that God sent his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh for sin, condemned sin in the flesh. So as a man, because Jesus became a man, he has emptied himself of certain things. The Bible says that Jesus can be tempted and was tempted. But then I read in the Bible that God cannot be tempted. Hebrews tells us, or excuse me, James tells us, James 1 and 13, God cannot be tempted with evil. And yet we know Jesus was verily God, in it. but at the same time he was verily man. So God could not be tempted with evil. But then the Bible says in Hebrews that Jesus was in all points tempted like as we are. So what has happened is Jesus has emptied himself of his God form, still God. But laying aside certain attributes of divinity to come to this earth and take upon himself the form of a servant. As a man, he could now die. God could not die. God could not, God could not be wounded. God could not shed blood. But as a man, he could die on the cross. As a man, he could shed his blood. So the first thing he emptied himself of was God form to take human form. The second thing is he emptied himself of equality with God. Equality with God. Throughout eternity, Jesus was co-existent with the Father. He was co-equal co with the Father. But when he comes to this earth, notice this. He says in John 14 and 28, my Father is greater than I. And he puts himself under submission to serve the Father. The third thing that he emptied himself is of omnipotence. Now, think about this for just a moment. Because many times we assume, well, everything Jesus did, he did it because he was God. No. When he came to this earth, he has laid aside omnipotence to become a man. Temporarily laying it aside while he's on this planet until the resurrection. Let me give you some examples of how we know that's true. Jesus said in Luke 4 and 18, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. Because he has anointed me to preach the gospel. He has sent me to heal the broken heart. Now let me ask you this. If Jesus is here in omnipotence, then why did he need the Holy Spirit to empower him to heal the sick? Why did he need the Holy Spirit to empower him to open the eyes of the blind? He has laid that aside.
aside to come here to serve. Jesus said this in Matthew 12 and 28. If I cast out devils by the Spirit of God. He said how he cast out devils. By the power of the Holy Ghost. Not by his own power. But he is under the anointing of the Holy Ghost. The second, the fourth thing, excuse me. The fourth thing that he laid aside was his omnipresence. Before, throughout eternity, Jesus was omnipresent. But when he comes to this planet... He confines himself to a human body, the Word made in flesh. One man comes up to him, one centurion, and says, My servant is sick, and I am not worthy for you to come to me. He recognized that Jesus was confined to a body, but there was still power in his word. So he said, Speak the word. Jesus said about Lazarus, Lazarus is dead, and I am glad for your sake that I wasn't. There. He's referring to him not being omnipresent. He's confined to a body. I wasn't there to heal Lazarus. Lazarus is sick. I'm glad I wasn't there that the glory of God could be revealed later. All of these are telling us that Jesus laid aside omnipresence. And the fifth thing he laid aside is his omniscience, all knowing. But you may think that's kind of strange. That's kind of out there. Let me give you some examples. The Bible says this in Luke 2 and 40. That the child Jesus grew and waxed strong in spirit, being filled with wisdom. He's growing in wisdom. Luke 2 and 52, Jesus increased in wisdom and stature and in favor of God and man. Isaiah had prophesied that the spirit of the Lord would rest upon him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding. So how did Jesus know what he knew? The Holy Spirit revealed it to him. The Holy Spirit revealed it to him. Jesus even said this in Matthew 24 when he's talking about the coming of the Lord. He said, of that day and hour knoweth no man, not the angels of heaven, but my Father only. How come Jesus doesn't know that day when he's speaking this? Because he has laid aside omniscience, all knowingness, to come to this earth. Now after the resurrection, when Jesus rose from the dead, that glory that he had with the Father before the world began was restored to him. So when he rose from the dead, he picked up all of the things he laid down. He picked up his omnipotence. He said, all power and authority is given to me in heaven and earth. When he rose from the dead, he was clothed back in his glory so that they would see him and they would fall like dead men. Hallelujah. And Jesus even prayed this prayer in John 17 and 4. He said, I have glorified you on earth. I have finished the work which you gave me to do. And now, O oh Father, glorify that me with your divine or with your own self, with the glory which I had with you before the world was. So now that I have established this doctrine, the kenosis, the emptying of oneself to serve, what does the kenosis teach us? I want to give you three things that kenosis teaches you and teaches me. The first thing is this. The kenosis teaches us that we are to depend upon the Holy Ghost. We have to depend upon the Holy Ghost. Amen. How did Jesus perform his miracles? Not as God, but as man anointed by the Holy Ghost. Acts 10 and 38 says how God anointed Jesus Christ of Nazareth with power and with the Holy Ghost who went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed of the devil for God was with him. How did he do it? The Holy Ghost was upon him. And if Jesus needed the Holy Ghost, you need the Holy Ghost. If he couldn't do it without the Holy Ghost, then you cannot do it without the Holy Ghost. You have to have the anointing. You know what I mean? I've come to learn is that really there's only one anointing and that's his anointing. He is the anointed one. He is. Christ means anointed one. Messiah means anointed one. Christ is the Greek and Messiah is the Hebrew but it means the same thing. It means the anointed one. Jesus Christ the anointed one. He's the only one that's anointed. But when I abide in Christ, his anointing flows to me. Psalm said it like this. How precious is unity. It's like oil that flowed down from the head down to the rest of the body. You are the body of Christ. He is the head of Christ. 
The anointing is on the head and it flows down to the body. So if I will abide in Christ. I can have the anointing of Christ. This, this kenosis teaches that we need the Holy Ghost because Jesus had to have the Holy Ghost. He flowed in the gifts of the Spirit. Gifts of healing and working of miracles and words of knowledge and words of wisdom. Jesus flowed in the gifts of the Spirit. He knew nothing but by the Holy Spirit. He did nothing but by the Holy Spirit. And He said nothing but by the Holy Spirit. Amen. He said, I only speak what I hear my Father speak. You see, the life of the Anointed One could only be accomplished through the Holy Ghost. What's amazing is when he gave us the Holy Ghost on the day of Pentecost, the same spirit that he walked in and operated in and that he healed the sick, he gave the same Holy Ghost to me and to you. And he said, these and greater works shall you do because I go to my Father. What he's saying is I'm going to take my mantle like Elijah had a mantle. I'm going to take the mantle of the Holy Ghost and I'm going to put it upon you so that when you lay hands on the sick, it's not you laying hands on the sick. It is the Holy Ghost of God. I'm not the healer. Jesus is the healer. And if he, if he is inside of me and operating through me, when I lay hands on the sick, it's as if Jesus was laying hands on the sick because of the Holy Ghost in me. The second thing that the kenosis teaches us is this. It teaches us servanthood. We need to hear this today. Why did he empty himself? According to the text in Philippians, why did he empty himself? To be a servant. To be a servant. Verse 8 says, being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death. Even the death of the cross. This entire verse speaks of servanthood. We don't like to shout about this. But this is where true ministry happens. If you aren't willing to serve, then do not expect to be able to lay hands on the sick and they recover. The heart of God is to serve. He humbled himself. He did not need the applause of men. He came to serve, not be served. The Bible says that he became obedient unto death. The word obedient. In the Greek, it's a compound word. It's two Greek words coming together. Hupa, ukua. Two Greek words coming together. And the word hupa means under. And the word akua means I hear. To be under what I hear. He was under what he heard. He became obedient to what he heard of the Father. To serve his Father and thereby serving others. And so the Bible says this. Let this mind be in you. What kind of mind is that? It is the mind of a servant who empties himself of everything that he is entitled to to serve God's people. A servant mentality. To serve those who others would say they are beneath you. Don't serve them. But this is the ministry our example, Jesus Christ, showed us how to be ministers, to get off our thrones, and to get down and get a towel and wash one another's feet. There's, I'm up here this morning on an elevated platform, but I am not above you. I am equal to you. And there's not one person in this room that is above the other. The, the ground at the foot of the cross is level. We're all servants of God. Some people want big titles. They want apostle or they want prophet or they want to put all these titles on all of these things. But the greatest title you can ever put on yourself is I'm a servant of God. When Moses died, God buried him. And God preached his funeral. God was the undertaker and God was the preacher. Here's what God said. Moses, my servant, is dead. That's the best funeral that's ever been preached. Because if God can say of me, he's 
my servant. That's the best thing that can ever be said of me. So this mind that he's talking about is the mind of the servant. So if you, if you have your Bibles, go back to the third verse. And let's, let's go back two verses from where we started. Because he says, let nothing be done through strife. The word strife in the Greek means someone who is competing for a position. He said, if you're in it to have a position, you're in it for the wrong reason. Let nothing be done through strife or vain glory. The word vain glory, again, it's a compound Greek word. It's two Greek words. Kinos, doxos. Kinos means hollow or empty. Doxos means glory. Vain glory means a hollow glory, a empty glory, a self glory. And he says that we are not to put glory upon ourselves. That's an empty glory. I am not here to bring glory to myself and you should not be in the ministry to bring glory to yourself. We are here to give glory to the only one who is deserving of glory and that is Jesus Christ. He says, but in loneliness of mind, let each esteem the other better than himself. Oh, hallelujah. Think about this passage. The people that I preach to you, he said to esteem them, to treat them better than I treat myself, to serve them. Loneliness of mind means to think lowly or to think humble about who I am. And most people, at least in America, I have found that most people have a, they find they have a struggle finding a balance between self-esteem, between thinking too lowly of themselves or uh, poor self-esteem or pride. It's one or the other, but we have to come to a balance. Most people struggle finding that balance in self-esteem. But humility is not an inferiority complex. It is the ability to see oneself through one's rightful condition, and that is saved by grace. Amen. Jesus could serve because he knew who he was. He was confident in who he was. Therefore, he had no problem serving others. Service was never a threat to Jesus because he never lost sight of who he was. He was never insecure in his identity. He knew his position with the Father. Likewise, when you know who you are in Christ, you are a saint, you are a child of God, then rendering service to others will not be a problem. It's when you do not know who you are that serving becomes a problem. When you have to have the praise of man instead of the approval of God, then you have a problem because you don't know who you are. When I know who I am, I don't have to have anybody else praise me. I just want to be approved by Him. And when I am approved by Him, I can serve others. Let this mind be in you. And the third thing that the kenosis teaches is God's way of being lifted up. When Jesus emptied himself and came to this world, laid aside his divine attributes of omnipotence and omnipresence and omniscience, and even the ability to die, laid all of that aside to come here. When he died on that cross, three days later, God raised him up. And the text says this, Wherefore, you know what that means? Because Jesus did this, because Jesus emptied himself, therefore, wherefore, this is why. Because Jesus emptied himself, the product was God has highly exalted him and given him a name that is above every name. That at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow of things in heaven things in earth and even things under the earth and every tongue confess that he is Lord to the glory of God the Father. You see, what Kenosis teaches us is uh, if we will humble ourselves, God will lift us up in time. God will exalt you in due season. 
Because Jesus humbled himself and was exalted. He became the lowest of low and now he's the highest of high. There is no higher than him. But he became the lowest of low. He went lower than the earth. He descended, the Bible says, into the lower parts of the earth. Wherefore God has highly exalted him. And at his name, you see, this teaches us that if we will be humble servants ourselves, God will exalt us. James 4 and 10 says, Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and he shall lift you up. First Peter 5 and 6 says, Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, and he will exalt you in due season. There's coming a day when everything that I've done for Christ, every way that I've served him, it'll be shouted from the house. But until that time, I'm not going to let my left hand know what my right hand is doing. I don't have to have anybody announce it or broadcast it or put it on Facebook or social media. I just want to serve Jesus. And one day when I stand before him, he's going to give me a crown. Many, many crowns. And I'm going to take those crowns and I'm going to lay them back down in his feet. Because it's not me that, 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 that was the reason I'm in heaven. It's because of him that I can make heaven. I want to pray over you. Do you want to be a servant of God this morning? Do you want the mind of Christ this morning? Do you want to be filled and empowered with the Holy Ghost this morning? Let us pray. Lord, I thank you for these young people. I thank you for these preachers. I thank you for every man and for every woman that you have called to preach and to share the gospel. And in calling them to preach, you have called them to minister. And in calling them to minister, you have called them to serve. God, may we never lose that tender heart before you. May we never lose that servant's heart before you. God, these young men and women, they stand before kings. They may stand before queens. But God, let them remember when it's all said and done, they are your servant. And they are not above anybody. That the lowest of the low in the kingdom of God, they're still called to serve you. God, keep us humble before you. And empower us with your spirit. God, we cannot do this without the Holy Ghost. We cannot preach without the Holy Ghost. We cannot witness without the Holy Ghost. Empower us, Holy Spirit. Equip us and anoint us to lift up the name of Jesus all across God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.